Great. Welcome, everyone. We're just going to let our guests file in. Welcome to today's event. We're very excited to be here. Uh, this is Scott from SciTrain. My colleague, Gareth, is going to join us in just a moment. Today's event is the power of positive communication and the future of publishing. We're talking, of course, about peer review. This is peer review week. And welcome, everyone, for joining us today. Let's see how many guests we've got coming in. We still have people filing in. That's great. So we'll give our guests a few minutes to join us. Professor Dyke, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Scott. How are you doing today? Everything's okay with you? Fantastic. Doing fantastically well. It's another hot, steamy day here, here in Tokyo. Back to the hot weather again. That's great. We've got participants coming, I think, from all over the world. Like for you, maybe it's the morning. For you, maybe it's the evening. But nevertheless, welcome to this Bentham event. We're here 24 hours a day, aren't we, Gareth? We never sleep. We only care so, about researchers. <laughs> we are <laughs> help researchers 24-7. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to share... Looks like Dr. Dyke is on a bit of a slow connection here. So while our guests are filing in, let me just check and see if he's able to log in. Okay, if you're just joining us now, we're going to kick off in just a minute. We're giving time for our guests to join us today. Welcome to Peer Review Week. It's Thursday. Our event today is the power of positive communication and the future of publishing. Let's just give Dr. Dyke a minute here to get reconnected. He's having some connection issues. So let's give us a moment here. Also gives time for our guests to come in and uh, file into the room and join us today. Hope everyone's doing fantastically well. Okay, while Dr. Dyke is reconnecting, again, welcome to everyone. Hope you're having a great peer review week. We'll just give it a minute here for our guests and our star panelists to reconnect. Okay, our guests are still filing in. Just give us a moment here. Dr. Dyke is having a bit of trouble reconnecting here, so um, we'll get going in just a minute. Apologies, everyone. Give us a moment here. Okay, for those just joining us, uh, Dr. Dyke is having some connection problems, but we should be able to connect them soon. Thank you for your patience, everyone. We'll get started very soon. Just give us a moment here to uh, get everybody connected.
apologies again to our guests. We're just getting everybody connected here. So just give us a moment. Hi, everyone. Apologies to our guests. We're still getting everybody connected here. So just give us a moment to uh, get our panelists online again. Apologies again. Just give us a minute here. Greetings, Professor. Welcome back. That's very strange. How, uh, thank you so much, everybody, for your patience. I'm really sorry for the for the for the horrible start to this event, but like I hope everybody's doing well. How are we doing, Scott? We have some guests with us. Everything's okay. We do. We do. I think uh, people are still filing in, but I think we can get started, Professor. Thanks. Shall we? Let's do it. Absolutely. And um, thank you right. for calling me, Professor. I I don't deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking today, everybody, about peer review, the power of positive communication, and the future of publishing, because after all, this is peer review week. So we hope that you're all having a fantastic peer review week. Have you attended any of our reviewer credits Bentham events so far? Well, Bentham has a very fantastic peer review process. If you'd like to learn more about the Bentham peer review process, I'm sure Scott's going to paste a few links in the chat box. Scott, what is it in particular about the Bentham peer review process that's captured your interest and attention? That's a great question, Garrett. I think that the system is uniquely robust at Bentham and the number of rounds and also not just the robustness of the peer review, but also the speed of review, I think is quite special and unusual. As we know, it's a common problem to wait quite a long time to have your paper reviewed. Bentham really prizes the efficiency of the process, but at the same time, without compromising the robustness and the excellence of the peer review. So I think that's what makes Bentham uh, a bit unique from my viewpoint anyway. Absolutely. So let's get going. Let's talk about what we're going to be discussing today, which, of course, is peer review. But if you're interested, as we get started in getting access to Bentham content for your library, do have a scan of this QR code because we're able to give you free access to all of the Bentham content for your institution free for three months with no obligation. So you can register for a free three month trial by scanning the QR code here on the slide in front of you. And that gives you access to the complete Bentham collection. So why don't you do that? If you're a librarian or a researcher with connections to libraries, do have a scan of the QR code that you can see on the slide in front of you. And we're gonna be showing that again a little bit later in our event in case you missed it right now. But let's talk about our event today. This is what we're gonna be discussing. We're going to talk about three things, and Scott will be back periodically throughout the event, and we're going to have time for questions at the end. First of all, we're going to talk about what you should know about before making a submission. Then secondly, we're going to talk about how you can submit your articles more effectively. And then thirdly, we're going to talk about how you can speed up that peer review process, because after all, this is peer review week, and that's what we're talking about throughout the week this week, how to be more effective as researchers managing the peer review process. So those are our points for discussion in this webinar presentation today. And what we're doing with a lot of this, with all of the events that Scott and I run together, is taking people round and around that academic publishing cycle, from ideas to funding to data collection, journal selection, article writing, and then submission, and then finally into the peer review and publication phase of the process. That's the academic publishing cycle. Maybe you've got a paper at one of these different stages. Maybe you're thinking about Maybe you're thinking about bringing a paper from the idea stage into the funding stage, or maybe you've got something that's ready to go at that journal selection stage, and you're thinking about how you can write the article up. Don't forget that we are here to help at every stage of the process. But let's begin 
you've got your paper ready, you're starting to think about where to submit it to a journal, first stage of that process will be journal selection. And if you're interested in publication planning or journal selection, do have a listen to some of our earlier events on the Bentham YouTube channel because we've provided lots of information. We will provide lots of information in the future about journal selection. But we would recommend that if you're ready with a paper and you're thinking about where to send it, have a look at making a pre-submission inquiry. Write to an editor. Ask an editor whether they would be interested in accepting your paper for submission to their journal or have a think about whether you might wish to use a preprint server. Academic publication is all about communication, really. Dear sir, many thanks for asking whether we'd like to publish your paper. It's good and original, but unfortunately, we're simply not willing to publish it. We always get those kinds of letters back from publishers. The question is, how can we manage the process. And that's the point of what we're doing at Bentham with SciTrain. We're trying to help authors around the world understand the writing and publishing process. Because of course, at the beginning of the process, the most important thing to think about is that you would never start to write until you've decided on a target journal. Every journal is different. What kind of paper will you be writing? Let's talk to colleagues. Let's make those pre-submission inquiries. Let's get involved. Let's go to journals. Let's ask them whether we would be suitable as a suitable outlet for your paper. So very, very important. And lots of researchers just don't do this. They write up their papers and then they think, where am I going to submit it? Which journal Am I going to choose? And that's often not the most effective way to be as successful as possible as a researcher. Decide upon a target journal and write those pre-submission inquiries. That is so because it's effective. It saves you valuable time. Journal selection and the use of preprint servers is something that we're often talking about in our events. Have a look at the journals that your international colleagues use for their submissions. Maybe make a ranked list of a top 10 set of journals that you could use for your next paper. Aiming high, but choosing appropriately. And don't forget our three rules for journal selection. There really is no limit to the number of pre-submission inquiries you can make before you submit your paper to a journal. You've got your work finished. You know what the key result is? Write to editors. Be involved. Get those pre-submission inquiries in because it commits you to nothing. You can then get a journal potentially lined up for your next submission before you send it to the journal. And that's a big mistake that many researchers make. They often complete a paper and then they think, where am I going to submit this? Where am I going to send this? Which journal am I going to use? What you want to do is write to editors. Write to as many as you like. There's no limit. You don't commit yourself to anything. Select a target journal effectively and reach out with your abstract and with your title if you have one. We'll give you lots of templates for these kinds of communications at the end of our event today, but communication is key. That's one of the takeaway messages from this training event today. Don't just write papers and then think, where am I going to submit it? Think about writing pre-submission inquiries to editors before you finally commit to making a submission. That's what I always used to do. Write to five or six journals with a pre-submission inquiry and see which of those journal editors come back to you with a favorable outcome. They might say, sure, we'd be happy to see this paper submitted. Or they might say, we're not so interested. Go to one of our sister journals. But this gives you a step ahead of the curve. Write to a number of journals. We'll give you these templates at the end of the session today. You really have nothing to lose. Don't make the mistakes that lots of researchers make by selecting a journal blindly after the paper is 
finished. And also have a think about preprint servers. Very important as well, because on a preprint server, Research Square, Archive, BioArchive, MedArchive, eLife, and so on, you've got the chance to share your work fast with other interested researchers. And peer review can often happen on those preprint platforms. It can happen fast. It can happen open if appropriately. And journal editors will come in and they'll select articles from those preprint servers. But don't worry if you're preprinting your work before final acceptance, your priority and author intellectual property are protected by a Creative Commons license. In fact, as we'll talk about in the q and I'm sure, because lots of people have questions about preprint servers, you are actually safer if you put your work onto a preprint server before you send it to a journal because nobody can steal it. What about if you give a conference talk, you give a conference presentation, you are going to be protected if you put your work onto that preprint server. So also very, very well worth thinking about. You can share your work fast with other interested researchers. You can get feedback from the community. You can also find a journal that would potentially be interested in your work. So is this a good idea? Is preprinting a good idea? We would say yes, it is, because here you have the chance to share your work with the community rapidly after you've done the write-up, after you've got the work ready. And CC licenses, Creative Commons licenses, enable you to protect your work from duplication. You've got the chance to be very well protected on a preprint server. And journal editors, like me, for example, we monitor what comes onto preprint servers, and we often select from work that gets preprinted to put into our journal. And that's important because you want your papers published as fast as possible. You don't want to wait for years for your papers to come out in reputable journals. You want them to come out as quickly as possible. And so with that in mind, if you don't have an ORCID ID, and by the way, this is one of the great ways to integrate with reviewer credits, have an ORCID ID, sign up fast on the reviewer credits platform. Make sure you have one because this is a great way to make effective submissions, things to do before you send your paper to a journal. In our last event, we talked about planning your publication. And if you haven't had a chance to look at what's on the Bentham YouTube channel, Scott, why don't you talk about that? Come back and have a look at the Bentham YouTube channel, what's there and what's available for researchers about journal selection. Great. Uh, thanks, Dr. Dyke. I'll share the links in the chat window to the Bentham YouTube channel in just a moment. But coming up next, we've got some questions coming in. We've got time for Q&A. We're going to stop two or three times today to take your questions. And we've already got a couple of questions coming in. But uh, first, I'm going to launch a quick poll. I'm going to ask everyone who's joining us today, tell us when do you usually select a journal at which stage of the process so here's our poll the options are before starting your research is that when you normally select a journal to submit to uh, before writing your paper um, while you're writing your paper or after writing your paper when do you normally select a journal let's see what our guests answered today we always get very different answers to this question don't we gareth let's see what our guests answered well, I can tell you what I always used to do when I was starting off in my research career. And it's probably what most people do. I write my paper and then I think, well, where am I going to send it? Which is usually what people do. But that's often what I learned, you know, from working with you, Scott, and working with other people around the industry was that's not the most effective way to be with a submission. It's really important to think about a range of journals that you could be sending the paper for and having a target journal in mind before you begin the writing process. Exactly. And there probably isn't a wrong answer here, but the sweet spot is generally uh, before writing your paper. If you have a journal in mind before you start your research, that's fine. You might have journals in your field of specialty that you're aiming for. And you're, as Gareth mentioned earlier, you can make a list of those target journals. But when you start narrowing it down, 
Uh, the idea is to think about that journal's requirements before you start writing your paper, or perhaps just after you've started and outlining your paper. Then you have an idea of the types of formatting and expectations that journal has in mind. So generally, uh, before or just after starting your manuscript is the best time to select a journal. Again, no wrong answer. Um, <laughs> probably any of these will work for you depending on your needs and requirements, but mm, you want to have the journal's expectations in mind as you write your paper. Great, thanks everyone for answering that poll. We've got some questions coming in, uh, Dr. Dykes. Shall we take a look? Absolutely, absolutely. Let's have a let's have a let's have a look at the questions. Fantastic. Uh, this is a question from Irene. Thanks, Irene. Um, Irene asks: I happen to read in the author guidelines of some journals that they do not accept articles that have been published on repositories or preprint sources. Interesting. Any thoughts on that, Professor? Yeah, there are a few journals that don't want to look at papers that have previously been pre-printed, but that's becoming less and less. Like I would say more than 95% of journals now are happy to consider work that's previously been pre-printed. The majority, the vast majority of journals are happy with that. So, I mean, as we've been discussing, it's a huge advantage to you as an author to pre-print your work before it gets peer reviewed and published because you'll get the chance to get comments back from the community. You'll get the chance to improve the work and you get protected immediately by that CC license that gets stamped onto the work on the preprint service. So I think Irene, maybe have a look at your journal selection. Do talk to us. Like we're always here, like get in touch with us because that journal might be a bit old fashioned these days in terms of what they're, what they're looking at in terms of what they're prepared to accept. Fantastic. Thanks for your question. It's a great question, Irene. Got another question here that just came into me on a private channel. This is from, uh, from Dr. Matsu. The question is, is there any limit to pre-submission inquiries? Well, there isn't, uh, although we should qualify that. This is different from multiple submissions, which you should definitely never do. But with pre-submission inquiries, there literally is no limit, is there, Gareth? No, you can send as many pre-submission inquiries as you like. I mean, because all you're doing is writing to editors and saying, I've got a piece of research that's finished or almost finished. I know what the key message is. I know what the key finding is. Would you be interested in seeing that paper submitted to your journal? And it's a very good idea to do this. Make a list of journals that you'd like to see your paper published in. Write to those editors. Some of them won't reply. Some of them will reply and say, make a submission. Some will reply positively. And so, um, uh, yes, great question. I would, I would say no, absolutely not. And that will help you to get into the mind of editors before you um, make your submissions. It's a great strategy. Fantastic. Thanks, Gareth. Okay, it's, uh, I think we've answered our questions for now. If you have more questions, uh, feel free to ask them, type them in the Q&A box. We love questions. So maybe we can go on to the next section for now, Gareth, while our guests are, are thinking of their it. next set of questions. Yeah. yeah. Questions are fantastic. Like, do get in touch. Like, do ask us anything. We talked about journal selection so far, pre-submission inquiries, finding a suitable journal. If you have more questions about journal selection and publication planning, as we've mentioned several times, do have a look at the Bentham YouTube channel where you'll find lots of extra information about these topics. If you're looking for more suggestions as to how to select a journal, how to plan a publication, as you move your work around that fantastic academic publishing cycle, that fantastic hamster wheel of academic publishing because now we are at the submission point in the process we're thinking about how we're going to make that submission into a journal and it's very important at that point of submission to be aware of the different kinds of editors that you might encounter as an author because in english we use the word editor to refer to lots of different kinds of people that you come across in the publication process journal managing editors who are overviewing the whole journal, academic editors, language editors, you know. So I'm a journal editor 
I'm managing the peer review process, but there will also be people that you might engage with who are going to help you with the language. So if you have any questions about who you're talking to at different stages of the process, do get in touch with Scott and I, because we're happy to help like English, lots of synonyms, lots of words for the same kinds of people. And when making your submission, let's not overemphasize the fact that you need a fantastic cover letter. You don't want to waste that opportunity to sell your work to a journal. You don't want to write something dull and boring when making your submission. Please consider this work for submission in your esteemed journal. You need to make sure that you tell the editor somebody like me or Scott or somebody sitting in a journal editorial office, looking at papers, evaluating those papers, deciding whether those papers will be sent out for peer review. You've got to convince that editor that the article needs to be taken seriously. The cover letter is absolutely critical. You've got to maximize your chances of success. The cover letter and many authors, as you'll see in a minute, unfortunately don't put much time into their cover letter. It's one of the first sections of the submission that an editor will read. You've got to make it count. You've got to think, why is the topic important? Why are the results significant? What's the key result, the breakthrough? Why is this an advance on previous work? And why are you submitting this work to this journal? Editors absolutely love it if you talk about their journal. And make sure you do reformat your cover letter if you're resubmitting it from a previous submission after it got rejected, for example, at Nature or Science, and you're submitting to my journal, which is way down the impact factor list, you need to edit your cover letter so that you don't say, you know, I'm making a submission to Nature, and then the editor will see that you've not even bothered to make those changes. And don't forget as well to make reviewer suggestions in your cover letter. We get lots of cover letters that look like this. Absolutely awful. No cover letter at all. It's really, really, really bad. People have not put the time and effort into creating an effective cover letter. Or they've just written something that's really dull and really boring, as we talked about before. Dear editor, please find our paper enclosed, which we hope you will find interesting. Yours sincerely, Gareth. It's not telling the editor anything about the article. It's not telling the editor why the article should be considered for that particular journal. It's not giving them any hook. It's not giving them any selling point. It's not giving them any reason to take the paper forward for peer review. So you do need to make sure that you are telling the editor why your work is important and interesting. Please find our original article enclosed, which we are submitting to your journal. We believe your readers will find it interesting for these reasons. And we would like to suggest the following people as suitable peer reviewers. Scott and I will provide you with templates at the end of our event today to help you make sure you do an effective job with your cover letters. Here's a screenshot of what our template looks like. All you have to do is feed in your own information into the template and you can cut out and keep this and use it for your own article submissions. But do make sure you do this because lots of submitting authors just don't bother because at higher impact factor journals, there's that desk rejection step. There's that initial editorial triage step where desk editors are considering whether or not the paper fits with the journal's scope. They're thinking, does this paper have a clear message? They're thinking, is it original? Is it important? Is it true? And does it fit with our readership? Is this article important to the readers of this journal? You really do have to think about selling yourself to get your work through article triage, we call it. At that initial stage after submission, when editors are thinking, well, will this paper be important and interesting enough for our readers 
for me to send it out for peer review. Don't forget that Nature and Science, those high impact factor journals, have rejection rates prior to peer review of maybe nine out of 10. So nine out of 10 papers that come into Nature don't get sent out for peer review at all. You've got to be in that 1%. You've got to sell yourself to get through that editorial triage. You need a clear message and you need a great cover letter. So very, very important, effective communication with the editorial board. Don't do what lots of editors do. And I'm sure Scott's also experienced this in his work. Where is my paper? I've waited two months looking forward to an immediate reply. That's rude, impolite and aggressive. But I get emails like that all the time. I don't know about you, Scott, but at the editorial office where I'm working all the time, those kinds of emails, those kinds of messages, absolutely terrible. What do you think? Yeah, working with authors, I experienced this a lot. And respectful communication is so important. Now, we do tell authors, don't, as you like to say, uh, Dr. Dyke, you know, don't wait communicate. But that means communicate respectfully, nicely. Ask what you can do to help the process along. So when I work with authors and we're communicating through peer review, the goal is to just get the communication going and see if there's any roadblocks that the author can help to solve together with the reviewers and the editor. And that means speaking nicely with people. Of course, we're in a hurry. Of course, we need to publish if everyone's in a rush. But um, speaking disrespectfully at any point in the process will not help your paper get through to publication. It's really, really tempting when you get negative comments back on your paper to respond immediately, or you've waited for a long time and you want to know and you write like a quick email. But it's so much better to be polite, give something back to the journal. I'm writing to ask if I can do something to help speed up my recent submission to your journal. Give the number of the submission. Give the authors on the submission because editors have to go into a system and they've got to find your paper, right? And can I make some suggestions for additional peer reviewers? One of the main reasons why your paper might be stuck in the system is because they haven't been able to find, the editor hasn't been able to find peer reviewers. So give something back to the journal as you move your paper around that hamster wheel that cycle of academic publishing from making a pre-submission inquiry making a submission and communicating with editors we're assuming that you're doing fantastic research of course you are you wouldn't be in the position that you're in if you weren't doing absolutely fantastic research but what we're here to do at bentham with our sci-train training courses is to help researchers manage the publication cycle. Make sure that their work has the highest possible chance of eventual acceptance in their target journal. And I think maybe there are some questions. I can see that we do have quite a lot of questions coming in in the chat box. Scott, do we want to stop for a moment and see if there are any questions or comments from the audience so far on our presentation? Let's do that. And uh, first, I just wanted to mention that I've uploaded three templates to the chat. There's a basic cover letter template for everyone there. There's a pre-submission inquiry template, which is one of our favorites here at SciTrain and Bentham. And also there's uh, a template for an inquiry letter. Again, that's the kind of respectful letter that we recommend you send when you just want to communicate with the journal and find out you know, what's happening with your paper. If you find yourself stuck in peer review or some stage is taking a little too much time, uh, use the template that I just uploaded. And you can send a nice polite letter to the journal just to find out the status of your paper. So I uh, take a look at those three templates that we've just uploaded. And there's a couple of great questions here, Gareth. Um, here's a question from uh, Satyajit. Thanks for your question. I hope I'm saying it correctly. The question is, is it necessary to reveal the publication model in a pre-submission inquiry? Oh, great question. Is it necessary to reveal the publication model in a pre-submission inquiry? Right. So for open access subscription, when you're sending a pre-sub, are you... Do you need to, to define that at the time you're sending a pre-submission inquiry? It's a great no, question. No, I think I think that's a fantastic question. And that's that's a new question um, for us, actually. We've never been asked that before. So fantastic. Like, no, because what you're doing 
is trying to get um, a journal lined up for your paper. So at that point, you may very well have in mind that I want to publish my work open access or I want to publish my work in a hybrid journal. So that might influence your choice of where you're making those pre-submission inquiries. But there's no reason to say to the editor at that point, I'm submitting a paper. I'd like for it to eventually be open access. That's a decision in a hybrid journal you can make once the paper gets accepted. It's much more about the quality of the research. It's much more about the quality of the science at this particular point, I would say. But that's a fantastic question. Thank you so much for that. That's really, really a great question. Yeah, thanks for your question. And uh, another direct question here from, from Dr. Matsu, I think here in Japan. Um, the question is, can you tell us more about the pirate code? Yeah, we didn't really elaborate on the pirate code. There are three three points. Uh, Dr. Dyke, tell us a bit more about the, the pirate code. Well, that's our little rules or rather guidelines for choosing a journal. When there's three of them, really, like just like in Pirates of the Caribbean, they're not really rules. They're more like guidelines. But aim high, choose appropriately, and we can help you to learn to sell and manage your submissions to journals. So if you're thinking about where you can publish your next piece of research, it's very important to select a series of potential journals and then rank those journals by impact factor and make your pre-submission inquiries and then submit your paper initially to the journal that comes back to you with a positive response that has the highest impact factor. And then if you get rejected, which of course can happen, that's life in academia, then you'd go to the next one in your list. And that's the rule. That's the way to be as successful as possible as a writing and publishing academic. That's why we call it the pirate code, aiming high, choosing appropriately. You can't publish everything that you write in nature and in science. And you've got to train yourself to manage your submissions effectively. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thanks for your question. And thanks for your answer, Dr. Dyke. Uh, here's another great question coming in. We have time for one more before the next section, Dr. Dyke. Great. Uh, the question is, um, an editor at Nature mentioned that a preprint paper is a working paper. And therefore, if the content of the preprint paper is similar to a submitted journal paper, the editor will not prevent the submitted journal paper from being accepted. If the content of a peer-reviewed conference proceedings paper is similar to the submitted journal paper, will the editor recognize that the study in the proceedings paper has been published prior to the publication of the submitted journal paper okay it's quite a long question did you catch that dr dyke i think so yeah like and that's an important question and the answer is yes the answer is yes the editor should catch that but you've got to also make sure that you communicate with the editor so if you are in that situation and i'm imagining that you're asking this question because you are in that situation it's a very specific question you must make sure that you communicate with the editor i have pre-printed my work from a conference and another paper has been submitted that's very similar to my pre-printed work because of course people make mistakes like it's difficult for an editor or a peer reviewer to be on top of everything that's coming out in the literature, especially if it's a big field like medicine. I don't know your field, but like, you know, you must help the editor. You must write to the editor and say, you know, what we've just been talking about, because of course it's not okay for a paper to come out that plagiarizes something that you've already pre-printed. That's not okay, but two groups of researchers could be working on very similar topics. And so two articles could appear one in a peer-reviewed journal and one on a preprint server on the same experiment for example so very context dependent thank you for that question i hope that um, we've been able to provide some insight but like you're asking that question because you're in that situation so do get in touch with us scott and i will help you to deal with it like in the specific 
um, case situation that you're in. But hopefully that was helpful. Thank you for that question. Great question. Thank you. Well, our next section coming up is peer review and publication. Uh, again, uh, keep your questions in mind and feel free to ask us anything as we go on to the next section. Are we ready, doctor? We are. We're moving around that academic publishing hamster wheel. We're getting towards the end. But if you're listening to this, like if you're an active researcher, of course you are. You're going to have lots of projects, as we've talked about before, at different stages of this cycle so we're moving into the peer review section of the cycle we're thinking about managing the peer review process you've got comments back from a journal and how you're going to deal with those comments is very important because how you deal with the comments that you get back on your work influences the eventual acceptance or not of the article so here are some tips for responding to reviewers comments from an editor or reviewers perspective, you've got to keep in mind that editors, people like me and Scott, we're not writing you emails about your paper, we're clicking buttons in an online system. So you will get a number of predetermined outcomes to your paper that could be minor or major revisions. So how you respond depends upon the kind of response that you've received from the journal and you want to be comprehensive. Show your editor that you're taking the process seriously and make sure you have all of the materials needed for that resubmission because perseverance at this point is a key to success. You've got to make sure that editors and peer reviewers feel good about your responses because if they feel good about how you respond, just as we talked earlier, if you're positive about your responses, then your paper has a higher chance of eventual acceptance. So we would like to thank the reviewers. The reviewer has correctly pointed out. We acknowledge, we concur, rather than I do not think the reviewers understand. It is not necessary to change. We simply do not have data. Be positive in your responses when coming back to a journal after peer review. Effectively responding to review comments is a trick and you can teach yourself to be good at it. We would like to thank the two peer reviewers who worked on our paper for their considerable efforts and for the time they devoted to our work. We've made almost all the changes requested and we're dividing them up so that it's clear to the editor what we changed and what we did not change. Our comments are in red and those are in response to the questions and the comments we received from the peer reviewers. So the peer reviewer might write, in my opinion, the main issue with this paper is that all the analyses should be repeated using a probability-based approach. And you respond to that as an author. We would like to thank the reviewer for this insightful comment. We've reworked the analyses as requested. You're helping the editor to understand what you did. You're making it easy for the editor to see, ah, they've made the changes requested. I'm happy with those changes. I'm going to accept the paper. And of course, again, Scott and I will give you templates to help you do this effectively. We've got lots of templates and here is one that you can use to make those responses to peer review. How you can intersperse your comments on a document with the comments of the peer reviewer. Don't worry about reading all of this information now. We'll send it to you after the event. We'll be in touch with you after the event to help you um, understand how you can do that at the end of our event. So we have templates. We'll provide you with emails at the end of the session today. But don't forget as well that often papers get rejected. It happens all the time. I get rejected often. There's probably only one kind of job that you can do other than being an academic, which will lead to more rejection, and that's working in sales. So if you get rejected and you feel that you've been rejected unfairly, it is very, very important to consider appealing that rejection to your journal. If you genuinely feel that your research is important, was well done, well written, and deserves to reach that journal's audience, you can always write 
appeal letter to the editor. What's the worst that can happen after all the paper's already been rejected, right? So the worst that can happen is it stays rejected. Be confident if you feel you've been unfairly treated, write to the journal. This is really one of the keys to success as an international researcher. Lots of people, when they get rejected, they think, ah, there's nothing I can do about that. And they move on to the next submission. But if you feel that your paper should be published, if the review comments are unfair, write to your editor and appeal. And again, Scott and I will help you with that. We've got templates that you can use to do that effectively. And we're always happy to provide feedback directly. If you write to us and ask about specific situations, papers that you've gotten through peer review, but that have been rejected, perhaps unfairly, we will be delighted to help you on specific cases. Thank you so much. Here's a journal email. Hello, and thank you for reviewing my manuscript during your busy schedule. I've made some minor modifications, and I've added two more authors. This is a big no-no in publishing. You are not supposed to add authors to papers after papers have been accepted. If you do send a paper to a journal, then you're making a commitment that all of the authors on that study know about and have approved that submission before it goes to the journal. So trying to add authors immediately after acceptance causes a great deal of alarm at the editorial office. So you don't want to be doing that. And at this point, perhaps we should stop or should we continue, Scott, to the end of the event? Are we going to stop now for a few questions or, or would you like to carry on? Um, until the end, because I realize that time is oppressing. Yeah, we don't have any burning questions just now from our guests. So uh, actually, this is a great chance for our guests. If you do have a question coming up, um, feel free to type it into the Q&A box or the chat box. We'll find it either way. And also just to mention that that fourth template, the um, uh, response letter template, I've just uploaded that one as well. So feel free to to pull that from the chat window. And as Gareth said, we'll also make it available for you after the event. But if you want it right now, feel free to grab it from the chat window. And if there are no questions just now, yeah, maybe we can go on to the next section, Gareth, and then that'll give our guests time to think of their next questions. Yeah, we'll have some time at the end for a few questions, I'm sure. But like, really, the main message of this presentation is that communication is key. You can do a lot with your submissions. You can manage your submissions effectively if you effectively communicate with editors, because this is all about communication. We are here to help you maximize your success as a researcher by talking to editors, by talking to peer reviewers, by managing your article submissions into journals. So if you have any questions over the process, just ask, just write to editors, just communicate with them and raise those issues and you will be able to be more effective as a writing and publishing academic. In my experience, and I'm sure that it's the same for my dear friend and colleague Scott, many people just write papers and submit them and forget about them and wait for the comments to come back. They don't engage. They don't interact. They don't talk to editors during the submission and manuscript peer review process. And that is one way, probably the most effective way, that you can significantly enhance your article's chances of acceptance. Make those pre-submission inquiries. We've talked today about what to do before submission. We've talked today about what to do to submit your papers more effectively. And we've also talked a little bit about how to speed up the peer review process. And if you've enjoyed this presentation, and you'd like to learn more, get in touch with Scott and I, because we're often doing webinars for universities. We're often talking directly to departments, to universities, to medical schools, providing direct training for research groups. And we'd love to do that for your institution as well. And don't forget as well that if you are a librarian or friends with a librarian or know a librarian or 
could be in touch with a librarian, here's that fantastic QR code that you can access to get your institution free access to all of that amazing Bentham Science content. And it is amazing. More than 160 journals, hybrid and open access. You can have access to all of that content for three months without any charge. So do scan the QR code and do get in touch with us. And I think now it's time to pass the baton to Scott as we talk about questions and feedback and, and outcomes from our event today. Scott, how are we doing? Great, we've got a uh, one more question coming in. And also I wanted to apologize to any guests who were not able to download the templates. Let me just do a quick poll here and see who was able to download the templates and who was not. I had a couple of messages here from guests who were having trouble uh, downloading the templates. Let's just see who was able to download and who was not. That will help us to follow up after with the templates. It looks like some were able to grab them and some were not. Thanks for letting us know. And sorry if you were not able to grab them. Uh, we'll make sure that you get links to those four templates after the event. Give us a couple of hours to get those together for you. So those four templates, again, were the ones that Gareth mentioned. It's the, uh, the basic cover letter for submission. It's the pre-submission inquiry letter. It's the general inquiry, like what's going on with my paper letter. And it's also the letter that you send with your revisions after your uh, first or initial stages of peer review as you respond. So it's your peer review response letter. So those four letters are the ones that I shared in the chat. And if you were not able to grab them, don't worry, we'll make sure you get the links to those four templates. So thanks for letting us know uh, that you were not able to grab those. And the Q&A, uh, let's see, we've got, uh, here's a great, another great question. This is um, from uh, Sai Ejit. Thanks again for your question. Uh, ooh, good question. Uh, Dr. Dyke, can we remove authors after acceptance? Is that a no-no in the same way that adding authors no, 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 is a bad idea? Why? It's not impossible, and that's a great question, but what you're doing when you make a submission is you're telling the journal that these people on the paper have all contributed to the paper. They're all aware of the submission, and they're all part of the submission. So you can add and remove authors, but it's very difficult, and it immediately raises red flags with journals and publishers. You would need a very good reason. Why would you submit a paper with an author listed on the paper and then want to take that author off after the paper got accepted. Also, why would you need to add people? I mean, it's very suspicious to journals and publishers. So lots of paperwork is needed to make it happen. For example, um, usually a form needs to be completed and signed by all of the authors, um, you know, asserting that they agree with this change. I mean, I can't really of a situation where an author would need to be removed from a paper unless that author has decided that they no longer agree with or stand by the conclusions in that study. I don't know about you, Scott, but like, you know, it's very unusual for somebody to say after a paper is accepted, I no longer accept the conclusions of this study. I want to be taken off as an author. I mean, that's very, very unusual. It does raise a uh at least a yellow flag. The other situation I can think of would be, what if you're the lead or corresponding author and then you felt maybe as often happens with early career researchers, they felt pressured into adding someone as a gift author. Um, check out our other presentations on why that's a bad idea. But it does happen sometimes, especially if you have a senior researcher and you're a lab leader who you know pressures you into adding them to a paper so they can increase their publication count that's gift authorship maybe the lead author had second thoughts about that and was having feelings of uh, obviously concerns about ethics of that and decided to remove that gift author from the authorship list that's the other situation i can think of um in which case yeah, kudos to you for making the right choice and not gift authoring someone. But at the same time, it does look a little strange, uh, doesn't it, Gareth? Yeah, I mean, it's far more common for us to get requests from authors to add people to papers mm -hmm. after they've been accepted. And that's 
in immediate like cause for concern like it happens quite often the paper gets accepted and then extra authors suddenly appear and that's that's an issue like i've i would say that in in many years of working as an editor i've only on a few occasions usually because of disagreements amongst groups of authors have i had to deal with situations where somebody's like throw the teddies in the corner and wants to be taken off a paper as an author but again lots of paperwork needs to be done to convince the journal that something unethical is is not happening so be very aware of that um you know because we, we are you know in publishing there are situations that scott's already talked about where you know people are are getting gift authorships or even paying to have their names added to papers so be very well be, be aware of that i would say Great. Thanks, Dr. Dyke, and thanks uh, for your excellent question. Um, I think we're getting towards the end of our time today. If anyone has any other questions, feel free to share them now. You can squeeze one more question in before, before the buzzer. Um, if not, we really want to thank everyone for joining us today during Peer Review Week. It's, it's, been, it's been fun, hasn't it, Gareth? We've had a great group today. It's been fantastic, yeah. And, and if you haven't had the chance to look at Bentham Science social media accounts, they're all listed here. If you're a Facebook user, there's a site for you. If you're a, a YouTuber, there's a site for you. Just have a look. And lots of our content is on the Bentham Science YouTube channel if you'd like more training videos. And indeed, if you'd like us to come and give a, a, a presentation to your research group or your institution remotely, of course, then do get in touch with Scott and I after the event. Thank you so much for joining us. And and um, yeah, Scott, thank you so much for, for hosting our event today. It's been absolutely fantastic. And, um, thank you, Dr. Dyke. Um, thank great you for to your see expertise. so many people and so Thank you, Dr. Doug, for all your expertise, and thanks to our guests for joining us today. We wish you the, the utmost success in your next submission, publication, and peer review process. And any questions, reach out to us. Thanks for joining us today. And go check out Bentham Science on social media. Thanks, everyone. Have a great peer review week.